All right, welcome everybody. Today we're going to be talking about SIBO and some of the natural things you can do to confront this, combat it, and just some ways to look at your digestive system because I know a lot of us, you know, we end up with these digestive issues like maybe cramping, bloating, we get acid reflux, and we think it's not a big deal. We think it's normal. It's normal if my digestive system doesn't work well, or it's normal if I have to take uh, a meprazole or, or a beta blocker or a an acid blocker, excuse me, but it's actually, it's very common. It's not normal. It's not normal for your body not to function properly. And so today, one of the things we've discovered, and it's been pretty phenomenal, just seeing the recovery patients have had is SIBO. I remember uh, there's a patient of mine and uh, he's been coming for at least 10 years and he struggled with horrible allergies. Um, I mean, he would get allergic to the snow. We would just joke because anything he was exposed to, he, he would get these allergy symptoms and he'd get brain fog and he's an architect and he had this, these cramps in his stomach and he could never get a form stool. And we got rid of his allergies. We got it feeling a little better, but it wasn't until we, we addressed the SIBO, the small intestine bacterial overgrowth that we were able to actually give him some lasting relief. And now he's got better energy than he's had in years. He's got more vitality, he's getting outside more, he's more focused at work. And so if you or someone you, you know struggles with digestive issues or you've got achy joints or you just don't feel as good as you could, well, you're gonna to wanna to stick around because today what I'm going to do is just shed a light on this, this kind of new phenomenon. I first heard about small intestine bacterial overgrowth in 2014. But now that we've got new treatment protocols in place, we've had 100% success. We've got Nicole Dreyer, who we call our gut whisperer, and she's phenomenal because she can literally, like when she works with our patients who have digestive issues, she's like instinctually can know exactly what's going on. So some of you may have SIBO, some of you may have other conditions. But first of all, if you look at the healthcare system right now, Medicare and their guidelines, they say care that seeks to prevent disease, promote health, and prolong and enhance the quality of life is not considered medically necessary. So at the onset of this, I'm going to be telling you, we're talking about all these conditions. We'll be talking about IBS. We'll be talking about autoimmunity. But none of the treatments that I am going to be sharing with you and some of the insights and some of the breakthroughs, scientific breakthroughs and otherwise, According to Medicare, they're not considered medically necessary, which I think is crazy because it's gotten us in this health crisis where 76% of visits to the doctor end in a prescription medication. So we want to reverse that. But think about the medications that people are on right now. And I, I think this is kind of an interesting snapshot because you'll see how these wreck the digestive system. And the majority of these top 10 most prescribed medications are actually contributing to this this massive threat to our immune system and to our overall body called small intestine bacterial overgrowth. So Lipitor. Lipitor is a high cholesterol med. That's number one. Number two is Zestril. That's for high blood pressure. Number three is Synthroid. And this, this list is from February of 2019. Number four is Nor Norvisac, which is another high blood pressure medication. Uh, Motrin is number five. That's for pain. And Motrin can be one of the most damaging for your small intestinal tract. It, it tends to stop peristalsis and it keeps food from being fully digested. So that's when you can get that small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Amoxicillin is number six. We used to give our cattle amoxicillin injections every winter. And um, now it's, it's still like a very common antibiotic prescription. And once again, if you take antibiotics, it takes you a year to build up the populations that you've just destroyed with that antibiotic. And so um, amoxicillin is number six. Number seven is hydrocodone. Now, if you know of anyone who's ever been on hydrocodone or if you've taken it, it causes constipation. Once again, just like Motrin, amoxicillin, when things aren't moving through your gut, that gives rise to these species that are invasive to your body, and then you end up with an infection. Prilosec, number eight, that's an acid reflux medication. And Prilosec, when it's blocking the acid in your stomach, you cannot absorb the proteins. You can't denature the proteins, you can't digest them. And so when, when you're taking that, you're like, yeah, I've got too much acid in my stomach, but actually it's just not true. That's, that's a myth. 
what it is, is the acid starts crawling up the fundus of your stomach and then it crawls up the esophagus because there's too little of it. It's trying to stimulate more acid production. But so many of our, our patients and so many of you have thyroid issues and the thyroid's not triggering your stomach to make more acid secretions. But when you take that, that acid blocker, it's just making things worse. And when you have this putrefied food that doesn't have the proteins broken down from the acids in your stomach, it hits the small intestine and then it's game on for whatever infection. And this can be yeast. Yeast love to overgrow in the small intestine. That's called SIFO or small intestine fungal overgrowth. And then the bacteria just thrive in that environment. Number nine is prednisone. Prednisone is arguably one of the most toxic medications out there, but it can be life-saving. If you have allergies, if you have an anaphylactic reaction to like a bee sting or, or something like that, prednisone can actually be very helpful for that, but it's used to treat allergies, asthma, arthritis, but any chronic autoimmune disease, um, you know, you're going to get on prednisone cycles off and on when you're in an autoimmune flare-up, but this will destroy the, the integrity of your intestinal lining and cause a condition called leaky gut syndrome, which we'll talk more about today. And then finally, Cozar, which is another high blood pressure medication. And, and many of you, uh, you know, you've listened to my podcast and you've, you've heard me talk about the uh, most commonly pr written prescription drugs. But in 2017, at the end of the year, the American Cardiac Association, their president actually had a heart attack and he's in his 50s, like 55, 56. And it kind of caused this alarm because they said, wow, here's the person leading America in the fight against heart disease. And he actually almost died from a heart attack. And so they actually lowered the parameters on hypertension, on, on high blood pressure, they lower the parameters. So now there's a thing called pre-hypertension. So you can get written a prescription for a hypertension much sooner than you could before. And it's kind of scary because now you see that there's, you know, in this, in the top 10, three of those are high blood pressure medications. Now I don't want you to have a stroke, but at the same time, what are these medications treating? Um, they're not getting to the root cause. And so what we want to do is let's take a step into what the root cause may be. So in Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, in uh, even uh, Greek medicine, the, the uh, wise Hippocrates said, um, let thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. So healing has always been considered to start in the gut. So let's go on a little journey. And um, when you start chewing your food, the very first thing that happens in this digestive process is you release this enzyme called amylase. And what amylase does is it allows you to break down simple sugars. And as you break down those simple sugars, that's where you start getting that instant energy. So if you're really hungry, or if you have blood sugar issues, um, that amylase is just going to give you that nice rush of serotonin because you just ate food. And you swallow that food, and very first thing that happens is the stomach acids connect with those foods and they start breaking down the proteins and breaking down the nutrients. The stomach is like the oven and it cooks your food, and then once that food gets digested, it's getting turned around in your stomach. That's why your stomach makes noises, which is called borborygamous, which is a really cool name. Um, and then once that food gets properly digested, then it, it exits, and it's the hydrochloric acid that's cooking your food, and it exits into the small intestine. Now, the small intestine has the, the pancreatic ducts are there, so there's enzymes to help you further break down the foods, but that's actually the major place where you're absorbing nutrients. And so you have this, this thing called an intestinal barrier, barrier, and these are just a single cell layer thick of endothelial cells, and they allow for the passage of essential minerals and nutrients, but they are too tight if you have a healthy intestinal lining these junctions are called tight gap junctions. They only allow certain molecules to pass through. If there's inflammation in your, in your small intestine from an infection or uh, from you know, medications like we just talked about, then those tight junctions open up and you have undigested food that leaks through your small intestine. And once it leaks through, your whole body goes into this fight or flight reaction and then not only is your gut, does, can you get a stomach ache, but you may not even notice anything in your stomach. You may notice brain fog. You might notice achy joints. You may notice that your hair is falling out or you've got low libido or you just don't have the stamina that you're used to. 
And it can all be from this expansion of those tight gap junctions and the leakage of food that's undigested into your body. So once you swallow that food, if the small intestine is working properly, you're going to absorb a good portion of your nutrients through the small intestine. It hits the large intestine. Or in, and in, excuse me, in the small intestine, that's also where your, your gallbladder will secrete bile if you've got uh, a gallbladder and that bile will start emulsifying the fats and then you'll absorb these fatty acids. And those fatty acids are transporters for all your essential vitamins, minerals, and key nutrients to help your body come to life and regrow itself. Once the food hits the, the large intestine, that's where it goes into the second phase of fermentation. And that fermentation phase is where the fibers get digested by your bacteria. So the bacteria love these resistant starches. So they love like if you eat plantains, they love that, sweet potatoes, rice. These are great resistant starches that your bacteria love. They also happen to love starches that are found in, in certain meats, like grass-fed meats. You get a certain uh, flourishing of some of the bacteria in your gut. But then the other thing that happens is you get hydrated as the food sits and ferments there. And then once your body has extracted all the nutrients that it can out of that, that uh, the food is now converted into fecal matter and the bulkiness in your fecal matter, sorry to talk about poop in the morning, but your fecal matter is um, what gives your stool that kind of density. And so if you have a, a nice form stool, uh, like we say, the, your foot-long floater, then um, that's because of the bacterial content that exists in your gut. And so ideally, a very healthy gut, you're going to have high quantities of healthy bacteria cultures. But as you'll see with SIBO, as your bacteria flora gets out of balance, you can have certain species that are invasive or that aren't friendly to you. And those can start to infiltrate and inoculate in areas of your gut you don't want it. And where you don't want a lot of bacteria residing is in your small intestine. Your, your small intestine actually, if you look at it, it's more of a sterile environment. But many people, because they're not chewing their food properly, they're not relaxing when they eat, many people are ending up getting uh, undigested food hitting their small intestine and it putrefies there and then that helps harbor these infections and this growth of the bacterial and flora. And then what it leads to is a condition called leaky gut like we talked about earlier. So what are the causes of this leaky gut? Because I think it's really important that you look at this because I can't tell you how many people, you know, and you, you yourself probably have leaky gut. I mean, this is something that's really important to test, but you look at it and you say, okay, what causes it? Well, we know gluten. Um, the gluten that we eat here in America is a typical cause of leaky gut. Dairy, like the casein in dairy specifically, can cause leaky gut. Whereas the whey, uh, which is another form of the protein in your, your dairy products, that actually may, may help leaky gut. Um, but inflammatory foods, so we know there's, there's gluten, there's dairy, um, there's soy, there's corn, there's peanuts, all those can lead to leaky gut. The other thing that can happen is you can get gut infections. And so leaky gut can be triggered by candida overgrowth. That's where fungus starts to overgrow in your, in your digestive system. Parasites can grow there or SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. And then some of the other ways you can get it is toxins from medication. All the top 10 medications minus maybe Synthroid, all those nine out of the 10 medications will definitely contribute to leaky gut, unfortunately. If you have heavy metal toxicity, pesticide toxic, toxicity, if you've been exposed to a lot of glyphosate, like I, I have been as, as a kid, um, BPA from your plastics, um, all these things cause leaky gut. And then finally, stress. And so I don't know if you guys have um, a lot of stress in your life or not, but let's just take a minute and take a few deep breaths because stress I find is probably the number one most common cause of leaky gut, which leads to more SIBO, which can cause a host of autoimmune disease. So, so go ahead and take five deep breaths and you can take your breaths just right as you listen along and um, just really get your brain in a relaxed state. So inhale, exhale. My Japanese teacher used to say the fastest way to die is to stop breathing. So, so start breathing, everybody. It's so important for you. 
So let's talk about SIBO. We're going to take a deep dive into this condition because I think it's, it's one of the most underrated and misunderstood conditions right now. Um, first of all, uh, some of the, the most common symptoms and complications with SIBO is, is you can end up with depression and you can end up feeling kind of just overall gloomy because remember the bacteria in your gut makes 90% of the neurotransmitters for your brain. So we all think depression's just in the brain, but depression's actually in the gut. Um, joint pain. SIBO, one of the most common causes of joint pain that we're discovering now is from SIBO, from the small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Diarrhea, so if you have loose stools, especially if you're going like 10 or 12 times a day, it's way too many. You wanna have maybe two or three at the most bowel movements every single day. Um, any of you who are, are experiencing diarrhea, loose stools, you can't get form stools, that can be uh, uh, one of the signs of SIBO. And then rashes, you can get acne, eczema, um, asthma, all these things can be very common symptoms. And one of the most common is going to be bloating. So we'll go through the 10 most common. You can end up with kidney stones, you can end up with osteoporosis, leaky gut, anemia, vitamin B12 deficiency, malnutrition, um, all from SIBO. So that's where you know a lot of, you see that movie, it's called um, Overfed and Undernourished. That is the environment in the United States right now because many people have no idea that they've got SIBO and you can eat the healthiest food on the planet and we can be so rigid on your diet, but if you don't get rid of that infection, that infection just can gobble up whatever organic foods you throw at it or no matter how careful you are with your diet, you don't seem to make progress. It's more than likely that you've got a bacteria that's contributing to SIBO and that could be Klebsiella, it could be a Staphylococcus. I mean, there's a variety of strains that we've discovered here or like I mentioned earlier, it can be a fungal overgrowth in your small intestine. So, so um, the other things that it can cause is you'll have poor absorption of fat. And I think this is one of the, the most difficult things to, to turn around because if you're not getting the fatty acid absorption, what do you think is going on with your brain? Because our brains are 57% fat. Our brains need fat and ketones to really thrive. And if you're not breaking down the fats or getting some emulsification there, then these uh, bacteria populations can just hop on those and go for a ride. So, so here's the 10 most common symptoms of SIBO. And these are people who have been tested. And by the way, to test SIBO, it's gotta be a breath test. And there's, there's different, there's a methane gas and a hydrogen gas that gets released from your breath. And by doing that, that test, you can discover, okay, yes, you do have SIBO. And what type of, of infection does it come from? Well, it depends on if it's a hydrogen or methane positive. Some of you are going to have both. But not getting it tested could be the most expensive thing you do with your health and your life right now. So here's the top 10 symptoms. Number one, bloating and gas. 76% of people who have SIBO have bloating and gas. You tire easily and you have weakness, that's 65%. Anxiety, 50%. Abdominal pain, 48%. Sleeplessness, sleeplessness 44%. Constipation, 42%. Food intolerance, 42%. Irregular bowel movements, 37%. Weight loss or weight gain, 36%. And joint pain, 34%. So if you have any one of these top 10 symptoms, you definitely want to look and find out, is the root cause SIBO? Do I have a bacterial overgrowth that's coming in? Because the other contributing factors, and we'll get into causes in just a minute here, but one of the things you want to look at is, have you been told you've got IBS? And you're, you're saying, well, yeah, I've got IBS, but um, the doctors can't do anything about it. And I'm just been put on medication, and if it gets worse, then I'll probably get a diagnosis like colitis. And what we found is that in 84%, there's a study with over 400 uh, people in this study, all who had been diagnosed with IBS, and they actually tested these people, and they found that 80% of the IBS sufferers also had tested positive for SIBO. Now, there's not a 100% foolproof test for SIBO. The only way you can know 100%, I mean, the methane and hydrogen test is it gets you about 85% of the way there, maybe 90%. Stool test will get you about 60% of the way there. But really, it's a biopsy of the small intestine where you actually go in there and 
and take a look, but that's pretty invasive. So we don't recommend that. But we do know in the studies that they've done, the prevalence of SIBO with people who have IBS is 80%, so very high. So what causes SIBO? So one of the biggest causes that often goes misdiagnosed or overlooked is a traumatic brain injury. So you have this nerve called the vagus nerve. It's the wandering nerve. And that goes into your gut, and it's the longest nerve of the body minus the sciatica. And that is the nerve that connects all your digestive functions to your brain. It's arguably one of the most important nerves in your body. But when you get a traumatic brain injury, and if there is inflammation in your brain, what happens is that nerve starts to get pinched off. It starts to get, it squeezes itself down. And then there's not <clears throat> any signals that can come from your digestive system to your brain. So one of the, the most common causes is traumatic brain injuries. It can be caused by a decrease in digestive enzymes, low stomach acid, and then it can also be um, from certain medications. It can even be caused by birth control or acute gastroenteritis. So if you have this, this acute inflammation in your intestines, that inflammatory reaction causes a disruption in the healthy bacteria in your gut, and that can trigger SIBO. It can be caused by nutritional deficiencies, hormonal imbalances, and it can also be caused in, by a diet that's high in carbohydrates with lots of starches, complex sugars. And so eliminating those is key because what SIBO can contribute to, and any digestive element, it contributes to autoimmunity. And actually, if you have one autoimmune disease, your chances of having additional autoimmune diseases triple. So a lot of us, we just think, well, you know, Crohn's disease, um, you know, or ulcerative colitis, you know, those are just for other people and those autoimmune diseases are genetic. Well, what we're learning is that these, these diseases like Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, um, even we're looking at like neuropathy, it starts in the gut. All the autoimmune diseases start in the gut and then it's the gut and the bacteria in your gut that influences the genes, not the other way around. So what can you do about this? So let's talk about some solutions. So my wife has uh, been on a SIBO diet and the last few days she's been on the elemental diet and uh, she's noticing um, already like some change in her overall body structure, um, changes in her energy. And so, you know, it's, it's a path that I think will, will help her immensely. And it, as it's helped hundreds of our other patients. So, so some of the things that you want to avoid is there are certain vegetables that you want to avoid. So you want to avoid garlic, onions, artichoke, asparagus, beetroot, cabbage, cauliflower, leeks, mushrooms, okra, peas, potatoes, radicinos, radishes, spring onions, snow peas, sugar snap peas, taro, turnips, and yams. Some of the proteins you want to avoid is you want to look at the sausages and the patties and anything that has flour on it, any proteins that have flour on it, avoid those. You want uh, fruits you want to avoid, apples, avoid apricots, blackberries, cherries, custard apples, dates, dried fruits, figs, fruit juices, guava, mango, nashi pears, nectarines, peach pears, persimmons, plums, prunes, tomato juice, tomato paste, and watermelon. The fats and oils you want to avoid if you have SIBO, are canola oil, cottonseed oil, safflower oil, soy, soybean oil. The nuts you want to avoid are pistachios and cashews. The grains you want to avoid are amaranth, arrowroot, barley, breakfast cereals, buckwheat, coconut flour, corn flour, durum flour, Ezekiel bread, camet, millet, oats, pasta, pea flour, polenta, psyllium husks, quinoa, rice noodles, rice bran, rice flour, rye, sago, seed flour, semonilla, sorghum, soy flour, spelt, tapioca, tapioca flour, wheat and wheat germ. The dairy you want to avoid is buttermilk, coconut milk, coconut yogurt, coconut ice cream, condensed milk, cottage cheese, cream, cream cheese, custard, dried milk, solids, evaporated milk, ice cream, margarine, and milk from cows, goats, or sheep, processed cheeses, rice milk, ricotta cheese, sour cream, sour, soybean milk, soy cheese, soy ice cream, yogurt. The seasonings and flavors that you want to avoid are fenugreek, kudzu, licorice, miso, tamarino, MSG, and then avoid all legumes. So no beans, no adzuki beans, baked beans, chickpeas, dried canned beans, kidney beans, lentils, no soybeans, no mung beans, and then watch out for any additives like chicory, 
um, any inulin, uh, onion or garlic powder, uh, carrageenan, uh, look out for, for thickeners or stabilizers. Um, watch out for cellulose, cornstarch, MSG, xanthan gum. And then the sweeteners that you want to avoid <clears throat> is the aspartame, the agave syrup, the barley syrup, corn syrup, uh, coconut sugar, date sugar, dextrose, fructose, fruit juice concentrate, golden syrup, glucose, high fructose corn syrup, honey, maple syrup, malitol, maltodextrin, mannitol, molasses, palm sugar, pectin, rice syrup, Splenda, sucralose, sugar, turbinado, and xylitol. And then finally, the beverages to avoid is the chamomile tea, the fennel tea, alcohol, tap water, fruit juices, and soft drinks. Okay, so now that you have tears streaming down your eyes, I'm gonna to talk to you about foods you can enjoy if you have SIBO. Okay, so the vegetables you can enjoy. Alfalfa, bamboo shoots, bok choy, capsicum, carrots, chives, cucumber, egg, eggplant, endive, ginger, green beans, kale, lettuce, olives, parsnip, pumpkin, silver beet, spinach, squash, zucchini, beetroot, broccoli, and with the beetroot, you can do two slices, broccoli, a half a cup, Brussels sprouts, a half a cup, butternut pumpkin, a half a cup, celery, one stalk, fennel bulb, a half a cup, green peas, uh, a quarter of a cup, sweet corn, half a cob, sweet potato, half a cup, fruit, no more than two to three servings per day, a ripe banana, blueberries, cherry tomatoes, durian, grapefruit, honeydew melon, kiwi fruit, lemon, lime, mandarin orange, papaya, passion fruit, pineapple, raspberry, rhubarb, rock melon, strawberries, tangelos, tomatoes, avocado, three quarters of an avocado, lychee, you can have less than five, and then grapes, less than 15. Sweeteners that are okay if you have SIBO are stevia. That's it. Proteins, good proteins to eat if you do have SIBO. Lamb, beef, pork, kangaroo, chicken, turkey, duck, fish, and seafood, and then eggs. Unless you have uh, some type of viral infection, then avoid the eggs. Um, nuts, almonds, almond butter, Brazil nuts, chestnuts, hazelnuts, mac nuts, pecans, pine nuts, pumpkin seeds, sesame seeds, walnuts, and water chestnuts. And then dairy. Dairy and milks is almond milk with no sweeteners. Make sure you read the label on that or none of the, the preservatives in there. Um, other, and other nut milks are fine. Uh, butter, ghee. Um, and then the lactose-free yogurt. Seasons and flavorings, uh, Celtic sea salt, Himalayan salt, pepper, fresh herbs, dried herbs, ginger, uh, vinegars, unless you have yeast and watch out for the vinegars, unless you test positive for CFO. Um, fats and oils, almond oil, avocado oil, or coconut oil, flaxseed oil, garlic confused olive oil, ghee, grapeseed oil, lard, macadamia oil, olive oil, palm oil, rice bran oil, sesame oil, tallow, and walnut oil. And then finally, the beverages are spring water, filtered water, herbal teas, just not chamomile or fennel, and then coconut water from kefir, just less than 100 uh, milliliters. So hopefully this gave you some insights, some great breakthroughs that you can start adding into your life right now. Do not try to do this on your own. If I can give you one word of caution, the worst is when you just try to dive into a SIBO diet because you've got some of these symptoms without actually testing and finding out that you've got it, you can end up with, with more nutritional imbalances than you already have. So, so give us a call, work with us um, at East West. Uh, you can find us at AccuEastWest.com and let's find out how we can transform your life, transform your health and get you back to living the life you love. So thank you very much and we'll see you next week.